Hello, I'm Tom Huber from the Physics Department at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. Today we're going to be talking about optical measurements of acoustic fields using refractovibrometry. I'll give a brief overview of refractovibrometry, followed with a comparison between some needle hydrophone measurements and some measurements using this technique. Finally, we'll talk about several techniques to improve the signal to noise ratio for refractovibrometry and some conclusions. So to begin, refractovibrometry is a technique where the, based on the acousto-optical effect, namely that the sound wave is a time varying density which changes the index of refraction. The vibrometer beam passes through a water tank off of a retroreflector. When the sound wave passes through the vibrometer beam, there's changes in the optical path length, which are converted into voltage versus time. And by plotting thousands of these, we can make video of traveling ultrasonic waves. So the, the first thing that I'm going to discuss is a comparison between the ultrasonic distribution measured with tomographic reconstruction of this to conventional measurements with a needle hydrophone. So first of all, we needed to create an asymmetric ultrasound source. So we start out with a 25 millimeter planar one megahertz source and mount an aluminum plate at 40 degrees with a five millimeter slot. Now, because the speed of sound in aluminum is faster than in water, the ultrasound that strikes the plate undergoes total internal reflection. So the ultrasound that emerges from this slot is a distribution roughly 25 millimeters by five millimeters. So to verify this, we raster scanned a half millimeter precision acoustics needle hydrophone to measure the beam distribution, plotted the peak to peak pulse amplitude versus position, and we see that as expected, we get our 25 millimeter by five millimeter distribution. So now we wanted to verify the same technique using refractovibrometry. So each of the scan points that we measure is measuring the integrated ultrasound in the beam direction. So this is sort of similar to X-ray imaging where we get just a projected image. However, similar to CT reconstruction, we can combine multiple projections at different angles to get a 2D slice of this ultrasound distribution. In this case, we are going to leave the vibrometer fix and rotate the target and the transducer. So we measured the refractovibrometry projections every half degree, and at each angle, we measured 763 scan points in a row, each average of 50 ultrasound pulses. Then using MATLAB, we can perform an inverse radon transform to back project these into a single 2D slice. So this is the resulting slice of the ultrasound distribution, the maximum peak to peak amplitude. Now, the circular artifacts that we see in this are an artifact of the acquisition and reconstruction process and something that we're continuing to work on to refine this. What we notice is that the distribution is roughly 25 millimeters by five millimeters. To compare this more carefully, we can plot a slice through these 2D distributions. So the blue curve here is the needle hydrophone measurements, and the red curve is a slice through the refractovibrometry profile. And what we notice is that we get very good quantitative agreement between the needle hydrophone and the um, tomographic reconstruction. 
except in the region of the tails. And then we can do the same thing along the other axis and again get very good agreement. We repeated this process at four different vertical positions from the target and got similar results at each distance. So what we can see is that this tomography using refractive vibrometry, it can be used for quantitative optical measurements of ultrasound distributions. Again, there is no physical transducer in the tank measuring these distributions. One of the big challenges that we have with refractive vibrometry, however, is that there's a low signal to noise ratio. So to get around this, we generally have to emit multiple ultrasound pulses separated by about a millisecond. And then we either mean or median average many pulses together to get better signal to noise ratio. So what we see is large amplitude features show up with very few averages, but a lot of the smaller features require a lot more averaging. And as we take additional averages, so instead of eight pulses, 16, 32, or 64 pulses, the more averages we take, we get better signal to noise ratio and also better fidelity of some of these smaller features. So oftentimes we have to take dozens or even hundreds of pulses that we average. So a method that we're working on is using deep learning convolutional neural networks or CNNs. In this type of a model, we input a reference signal that's highly averaged and a corresponding noisy signal. We do this for thousands of pulse pairs and the neural network learns the characteristic time structure of real ultrasound signals and noise, such as some of the features that we see of the ring down of the ultrasound. Then we can take that trained model that's been trained on thousands of pulses and feed in other signals and have them denoise them. And so here's these same signals after they pass through the CNN denoising filter. And we can see that we've got excellent fidelity for the large amplitude features. And in fact, we've gotten back much of the structure that we would expect, but that's very difficult to see in this image here. Now, the other thing is that some of the small features are not well resolved again until we see many um, averages. So now what I'm going to show you is a data set that we took where we had eight averages. The geometry we have is we have a, a 3D printed plate here, and we have a stepped reflector at this side. The ultrasound is traveling from left to right, and what we have in this video is going to be before the denoising. This is after the denoising algorithm, and then for reference, this video is going to show the 512 averages data set. What you can look at is we can see that a lot of the speckle noise goes away and we also retain much of the structure that we expect. It also correctly enhances some of these small features and some of the other um, small features, however, are averaged away. Now I'd like to talk about one other technique that we've been exploring for 
improving signal to noise ratio and that's using sweet frequency ultrasound. So bats have developed an amazing method for echolocation where instead of emitting single narrow pulses, they emit long duration ultrasound chirps. After reflection, the echoes coming back are also long duration ultrasound chirps. And these are de-chirped into a short timing pulse, mathematically using a cross-correlation operation. Again, if you want to read more about how bats do this, which is absolutely amazing, you can read articles such as this in um, Acoustics Today. Since more ultrasound power is emitted in these frequency chirps, they get a much better signal to noise than emitting a narrow pulse. So we did the same thing where we emit a 10 cycle sequence from 0.9 to 1 megahertz in 10 microseconds. Then we took these measured signals, de-chirped them using the FFT cross correlation and compare them with single ultrasound pulses. What we can see is there's less random noise for this de-chirped signal than what we see in the signal pulse. One problem, however, is we get these leading and lagging side lobes that occur after this de-chirp operation. So now I'll show a video. The upper frame here is going to be this measured chirp signal that we emit. This frame in the lower left is the same signal after the cross correlation. And then you can compare that to the single ultrasound pulse. What we can notice is, first of all, there's a lot more speckle type noise in the single ultrasound pulse after the cross correlation, or the, than the cross correlation. But we're seeing very similar time structures with both. So the result is that as expected, using a frequency chirp and cross correlation, we can reduce the random noise at the expense of some of these side lobes and other um, artifacts that come in. And we're exploring windowing and other processing techniques to reduce those side lobes. So the goal is by using the deep learning and possibly chirp signals, we can substantially reduce the amount of time that it takes to acquire our refractive vibrometry images. So in conclusion, what we've shown is that refractive vibrometry is an optical method for full field measurements of traveling ultrasound fields. We can use tomographic reconstruction to obtain distributions that are consistent with needle hydrophone measurements and using deep learning convolutional neural networks and frequency chirp, we can improve our signal to noise ratio. And we are continuing to explore other methods for tomographic reconstruction and noise reduction to improve the technique. So I'd like to thank Gustavus Adolphus College in the physics department for funding, along with some of our previous students who have worked on this project and support from the National Science Foundation. Thank you.